We're here today in Montague, and this, this interview is part of the White Lake Environmental History Project, and we're with Rex Funnel and Dexter King and, um, and Marsha Funnel, uh, who is not being interviewed but is present, and we're here with Oscar Ospo, who is doing the, the videotaping. And just want to ask each one of you, you did sign the legal release, right? On what? Did you sign, you did sign the legal release form? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And you too, Dexter? Yes. Thank you very much. I would like to get started by asking each one of you just to tell um, a little bit about yourself. Well, I was born here in 19... When? 19... 16. 16. Born in Whitehall. Uh, I went to school and graduated from Whitehall. Played football. Basketball, baseball, at the high, the high school teams, but I was in the service almost just two months short of three years. Rex, was your um, is your family history here? You have other family in the area? Oh yes, my all my mothers, mothers. There was four girls, and they were all living in Whitehall. They all married and lived in Whitehall. One was a Zatsky, and one was a uh, Benjamin and my mother was a funnel, but Aunt Eva, or her name was Norris, she she didn't have any children, but all the rest of them had children. But they were all all the girls. And uh, then I went to Barber College after I got out of the service. I decided my mother decided that I should be a barber. Going with my dad had a barber shop, so that's when I got into the barber shop. And barbers were till uh, 19, whenever I, when I don't remember when I retired, but I retired then when I was 78. 62 years old. I decided I had always made my mind when I was 62 years old I was going to retire, come money or not. And, but other than that, I worked at the, they worked at the NP store for one one year, one summer, and I remember I went, every time I walked by the garage, Uncle Junior used to holler, call me. Yeah, we always wore bow ties. And he, he'd say, there comes the bow, 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 bow tied kid, but I could be going to work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Junior worked out in the front and Dexter worked in the parts part and I'm sometimes out in the back room where they needed cars washed and or whatever, he worked in the back part there, but uh, Junior worked in the front part. Uh, he had gas, to, they had pumps in that first one they had it there. Oh, we, oh yeah, we worked in the meat market. My cousin and I, when my granddad had a meat market there, and when he uh, had a stroke, and he had my uncle work there for him, and he decided he got a job, he was a postmaster, then they had that job open, Uncle Fran, Benjamin took the office for postmaster, and he got that, so they didn't have anybody in the post working in the meat market with Granddad Anger, and he got some lady to work in there, that, and her husband had had a meat market. And when Granddad Anger had the stroke, my cousin and I, Paul Zasky, Red Zasky, and I, went, they wanted us to take over the meat market. So we did, neither one of us knew the hind end of them front end of the cow, <laughs> but uh, we certainly learned how to cut meat from one end to the other. Well, I was born in Whitehall, Michigan on June 7, 1913, and I went to Whitehall High School and graduated from there. During the time I was there, I played uh, basketball, football, track, and ran in the track team. We were so, such a small school that it took everybody to participate in, in <laughs> these various sports. And uh, after, during the time I was in school, I uh, learned to pedal conicals in 1928, and uh, when I got out of school, uh, I 
was working at Pitkins in the popcorn machine uh, for a while. Then I went to work for my dad in the garage and I worked in the parts department and pump gasoline and I also worked out in the maintenance department. I worked there until 1935 and then I went to the tannery on January 7, 1935 uh, at 32 cents an hour. <laughs> And, uh, of course, they had been piling leather down during the Depression to the fifth floor, and it was piled from the floor to the ceiling. And so when I first got there, I worked with John Blake, We're taking those hides down and cutting them two in two, and took in the best ones for making haracha hide and the other for making bag leather. And then I went to the tacking floor and tacked leather for a while. And then I went into the uh, department downstairs to keep uh, the materials that were being used in the tanner. And when I made out the first uh, report for uh, Grand Haven, we were short about $50,000 because the people in the shop had been taking these various things and using them and not charging them off. And my predecessor, when he made out the, the tax report, he just took the book and took what was ever in the book. He never knew what was going on. And then from there, I started to work up in the tannery. I became personnel director, and then I was in charge of the office. And then I went out and was in charge of uh, the lower end of the tannery. And I gradually worked up in the various positions until the last few years before I left the before I retired from the tannery, I was operating the tannery. So I had a busy 43 years in the tannery, and I got along well with the union. Uh, I tried to treat them like I would be treated, and of course I had to do what Nashville said. But so be it. When did we have the strike in down the tannery, Dexter? Pardon? When did we have the strike? When did we the have? The union had a strike down there. Oh, sure, we had a strike and we had to negotiate a new contract. Yeah. But I still got along good with the union. I, I tried to listen to them, but <laughs> I was sorry. I could only do so much. I went yeah. down to, to Genesco one time and asked them for 10 cents an hour for day workers. And of course, after a three hour meeting with the brass down there, they said, no way. You give this money at your next contract. And I said, no. I said, we recognize now that there's that difference and I want 10 cents now. So after the brass left, my boss says, now, Dexter, what do you want to do? And I said, I want 10 cents an hour before Christmas. And he said, you know, Dexter, I'm going to give you that 10 cents an hour, and when that contract comes up, I'm going to hold you responsible for settling it. I said, I'll do all I can, but I want you to give the people as much money as you can afford to give them, not as much as you think you can get away with. <laughs> so that was my meeting, and, and of course, uh, I played in the orchestra, and I was out the VFW one time, and the head of the union came to me as we were both having a drink at the bar, 
and says, Dexter, do you know, all the time you worked at the tannery, we always thought that you were fair with us and was going to do the best you could for us. <coughs> so that made me feel good. <laughs> and I retired from the tannery in uh, 1978 after spending 43 years there and I get a great big pension from them, $2.64 a month. <laughs> you didn't belong to the union. <laughs> you didn't belong to the union, did you? <laughs> so 43 years at the tannery, starting at the bottom and going all the way to the top. Right. Yep. Right. So was it a good experience? Um... I think, oh, I was going to ask you, what do the tackers do? I know there was a picture here. And I, I was curious to know what a tacker did. In well, the I'll tell you, when we were tacking, Toddy Grohl and I were partners. We had a platform that was about, oh, maybe five, six, seven feet square. And we were tacking calf skin. And... Uh, we would, he would put a couple tacks on the tail end and I would put a couple on the front. Then we would, he would get one of the shanks and tack it and I would get one of the head part and tack it and so forth with the other one. Then we had to tack it all the way around. And of course, we had to hold the tacks frames. between our fingers and we hit them with a flat, flat a pair of Pliers. pliers, and it, when that tack bent over, that you meant your finger. thumb was going to get cracked. So my thumb was black and blue most of the time, and I had a groove between that finger and my thumb yeah. where I was holding on the tack so tight that they wouldn't fall. Now, yeah. what was the purpose of tacking the hide so they would stretch dry? Them. Stretch them. Oh, to stretch. dry. Stretch oh, okay. them out yep. to dry. Oh, okay. Yep. Was that the first? What was the first part of the process? Oh, that was way down there. And the of course, department. during the strike, uh, I got married during the strike in 1936, and and I told my boss I had to have a few days off. <laughs> so he said, "Will you hurry back? Because I want you to come up on the top floor and help me tack whole highs that they were running. And they threw them over the top." of a frame and then you tack those the same way. You didn't hold the tacks between your fingers, but you had to tack all the way around for it to dry. The nails they had them kind of big big headed on the nails that they had they they, 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 they tacked in there. Well but, uh, what were some of the other jobs at the tannery? What are some of the other jobs? Man, there were a lot of them. Uh, well, I started, wet end. I started working in the wet end. What's the wet end? Uh, of the tannery. Of course, the, the, the hides, when they, when they came in, were unloaded off a boxcar and piled on platforms. And for they took one hide off each pile that each platform that they filled up, they took one hide off. And those were used to, when they opened up, told what the rest of the car looked like. And uh, they uh, trimmed them and cut them down the middle. <clears throat> and then they took them into the beam house and threw them into a... a paddle wheels, but later on they got big drums that they put them in to wash the manure off them, and then they reflushed them, and they put them in the lime vats and, and treated them with lime and sulfide they call them to, loose, to yeah, loosen yeah. the hair, and they had to be pulled out to out of there to go to the unhairing machine. <laughs> <laughs> and from the unhairing machine, yep. they went into the tanning drums. 
Yeah. What did or they, they were treated with chrome and sulfuric acid and salt. And yeah. after they were tanned, they dumped them out and they were taken to the ringers where they were wrung out. And then they sorted them and then they split them. Then they shaved them and then they put them uh, up on frames and, and set them out with with uh, 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 with uh, paddles to to dry. They went through the dryer, and when they came out of there, they uh, were went up to the next finishing floor, and they went to the shaving department up up stairs where they run them through a buffing machine to trim off any imperfections on it. And then, of course, they had to go through the finishing process of getting dye on them. And, and they went through the spray machines that sprayed the... I'd have pictures of that. And then, when they got through with that, they went over to the smooth players and were smooth played or put it with an imprint if they wanted to put some other uh, thing on them. And from there, they were ready to go to the sorting department to be sorted and measured and shipped to Nashville for shoes. Some went for shoes, some went bag leather. Some was bag leather and some was shoe leather. So some was shoes. What kind of shoes? Oh, uh, any any leather any shoes. Leather. Yeah, I say bag leather was any kind of bags that you had, and they made leather for inside of cars too. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Not not in White Oak plant. No, they in Grand Haven did most. That of was that. made in the Grand Haven yeah. plant. Which was associated with the Whitehall plant for yeah. a while. I mean, when they were founded, oh, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was yep. Eagle Auto a leather company. Yeah. And also when they went through the splitting machine, they took the top top green and is what was the shoes were made out of. The splits was used uh, to make uh, shoes, uh, running shoes and and uh, sandal type stuff that was cheaper. But yeah. well, that sounds like a very lengthy process. Oh yeah, yes. they went through a lot of you know, spray painted them, and my brother worked in a, a for spray guns, and they had areas taped off for the guys who used spray guns to to spray them. When Raymond started, he worked at he worked on that. He never did get off. He worked forty some years on that spray gun. Right. Yeah, and they had what we called the soup kitchen. That's where they mixed all the paints for different colors. Uh, they'd have a samples there that they would mix paints up to match these samples that these guys, some of them at various tables, were, were painting well, with a small, uh, what, the, what they call those, that they put over the, the people that were, like a birth and then they were painting. The, some of them, and some of them they sprayed on, some of them they, right. they painted on with a, on a, lay them out on a table. And they with would, a pad. Yeah, with a pad they'd, they'd, they'd paint them, and uh, some of them were, were sprayed on the paints, and uh, that was the finishing department, they called it. But mo most of the time that Rex is talking about was before Janisco bought the place. Yeah. It was in Eagle Ottawa's days that they, they yeah. did all that. Yeah. After Janesco bought it, there was no more up there. They had their spray equipment was on the south end of the tannery and it, they, they just took a, the sides and run them automatically through this spray, spray machine. And somebody was on the end, took it out and threw it over a horse. But the, those jobs that Rex was talking about was all Eagle Ottawa pri private 
before Genesco bought it in 1944. They called them horses because they, they had uh, on wheels and they had built like this and they throw them over the top of those and they called them horses. Oh, okay. They throw the whole side over the top of those horses and that's why they called them a horse. So it was maybe a little more automated process after Genesco bought it? Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, well, um, how many shifts did the did the January regularly regularly run? Well, they were running two two shifts. Yeah. Uh, Some places three, but mostly it was all two, one or two. Of course, you know we could have produced more leather for Genesco, but they didn't want any more from us, and they wouldn't let us sell any of our leather on the outside. So we we ha could only produce so many hides a day, but uh, I I tell you, if Genesco had been smart, they would have had somebody buying their hides other than the right. man that they had buying hides, because we piled too many hides up in the fifth floor that we couldn't use. And that was because the, the man that was buying hides, instead of buying them from packing houses, like they were doing back in the Eagle Ottawa days, they were buying them from the Chicago packing houses. Yeah. Of course, they went out of business, so it would have to be packing house somewhere else. But uh, he was buying hides from odd lots that were picked up and they weren't properly treated with salt like they were from the from the packing houses. So uh, eventually uh, Genesco was notified that they do a better job if they hired a new hide buyer and that's when Scotty got fired. <laughs> what was his name? Huh? Scott, was it? His last name was Scott, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, can, uh, Rex, can you explain the relationship that you, you two have? Because I don't think that came out yet. How are you two related? Well, I married your sister, <laughs> the youngest one, and uh, that's why we, well, of course I knew Junior and Dexter to the garage, because I was, had to walk by there, I lived right next to the garage practically, so I walked by the garage all the time when I worked at the A&P store, and, uh, and I'd stop in there a lot of times and play cribbage and whatever, when I wasn't working we'd play cribbage and be in the garage, uh, just just talking to Junior and Dexter and the Lawrence's and whoever worked there, so a lot of us were around the garage that didn't even belong there. <laughs> like Bob Gifford, he was in there all the time. Yeah. And I was there and somebody else was hung around there a lot and we played cribbage and, and whatever. Well, you know, I had uh, uh, two sisters and a brother and of course my folks, mother and dad, they're all gone. I'm the only one left in my side of the family. But uh, yeah. I just figured I've been living too long. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they are all gone aren't the doors and Right. And Bertha and yep. Junior and uh, So are yours. You and I are the only two left. Right. <laughs> Yeah, your brother and sister are both. Gone. Yeah, my brother. Yeah. Well, what is your secret to long life? <laughs> well, we lived good lives. Well, that's, that's why I said we lived too damn good, didn't we? Yeah. No, didn't drink enough or party enough or <laughs> we partied enough. He didn't party as much as his brother did, though. No. Junior did the partying on their side, and I did the partying on our side because my brother didn't do much drinking or anything it either. And he didn't get married until he was 50 years old. And the gal he married was 50 years old and she'd never been married. 
and Raymond Lorraine met because Raymond would walk every night down the main the street there. She lived down that street with her folks and then they got talking and when they were both 50 years old they got married. But they graduated. Well you see besides working at the tannery I played in an orchestra for over oh, 30 yeah, they had years. The orchestra, King's Orchestra. Oh, and, yeah. uh, we played at the Jack and Jill Resort, I think, for 30 years. Besides playing there, we used to play at the Franklin House in Montague until after it burned down. And we played at, at VFW in Montague for dances. And we played at Fremont at the Ramshore and Country Club. And we played up at, at uh, Ludington for the Elks one night a week. So we played all around. And you played at the Ford Garage quite one one night a week too. Remember, I didn't they drive the drive the cars out on Friday or Saturday or whatever for their showcase. They had three or four cars sitting in there. They dry those out. We'd mop the floor, the wax the floor. We'd have a dance every what, Tuesday. One one night. Yep. One night one night a week or something. Right. They'd have a dance in the main. That part of the, uh, the showroom, the showroom of the of the Ford garage, which is now the one well, one on the corner there. What they do? That was in the early ages. That, that was in the that was in the early ages. Yeah, we had more people standing outside the windows <laughs> watching the dances going on there. Well, tell me about the basketball team. Both of you played on a basketball team that was. Uh, a tannery basketball team. Oh yeah, Rex. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we had we we would call the Black Eagles, and we had the, and they also had the, the girls had a team, and they, we had a second team for the boys that weren't the guys that weren't good enough to make the the Black Eagles, but we played. Uh, well, we played two or three games a week. Sometimes we played most of them in it when Hatton built that gymnasium then at Whitehall and Grand Haven. We uh, would we'd go down there and practice every night. And we were down, we lived down there when we weren't working. And then we, well, we had some good basketball teams. In fact, they brought in two or three guys, Sad Essenberg and Cook. And then we got Heine Clevering and sneak peddler out of Muskegon right. to play with us. And the rest of us were local guys. That played only th three or four of us were local. The rest of them we got like two Muskegon guys and and uh, and one of the uh, coach up at the school usually played with us. And uh, What kind of, who did you play? Oh, we played any place, Grand Haven, and they, they always had teams too in the, in, the, in the tannery down there. We'd play them a couple nights a week or a couple days, and we played in Grand Rapids. We played in Gra Lansing. Uh, Lansing. We played in L Ludington. We played in who else up north? That we had? was there anything else up north that we played in? The Manistee. I don't know what it was. Yeah, well, the Manistee paper or something. Right? Yeah, we played uh, any place that we, anybody that had a team, we would go play them or they'd come down here and, uh, in the tannery and play us. And uh, So different companies had different teams? Yeah. They didn't have to be companies. They could, the city, you know, could have a team too. Uh, say, Montague could have a team if they had enough guys that wanted to play. Uh, but most of them were sponsored by some factory had a had a factory that would would sponsor the teams in Grand Rapids. We played uh, two or three different places in Grand Rapids that were factories that had had teams. What was the 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 tanner or the outfit from Holland? The furnace. Uh, Holland Flying Dutchman. The furnace. The furnace team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember that game particularly because. Well, Ted, Ted Essenberg fouled him right at the end of the game, and he made both shots and beat us. Yeah, but Ted, 
Well, Ted ended up playing with us. Yeah. But he, he was from Holland. Ted and, and Cook were from Holland. They finally came up and got jobs at the tannery and primarily to play basketball. <laughs> and uh, so they played basketball with us. And uh, we had a guy, two guys out of Muskegon that played with us. Heine Clevering and Sneak Peddler played with us, not all the time, but most, a lot of the times. And, uh, Did you have to work for the tannery to be on the team? No. No, well, that's where some of these guys I was naming out of Muskegon, uh, Peddler and uh, Heine Clevering, they didn't, they didn't work there. But a couple, three of the guys, like Essenberg and Cook, they, they gave them jobs at the tannery to, to, to play well, to play basketball and also work at the tannery. And uh, well, there the was, coaches always usually There was one, one tannery group uh, that Rex belonged to that played, and whenever they went to play, they wanted me to go along with them, and I told them I had an orchestra job to play. They said, well, we'll pay the orchestra man for you to take your place. Oh, we want you to come along. But when the season was over, all of the guys that were on that team got jackets, and I never got one. <laughs> now, how, how long did that Black Eagles team play? Oh, quite a while, didn't we? Yes. It was quite a few years we played as Black uh, as Henry sponsored us. Yeah. We, are, are we played you? all over. We didn't have to. We actually didn't have to work at the tannery, but uh, if you were good enough and better enough, then they would. We, we, uh, I said, like we were saying, we had the coaches from all Montague and the coaches from Whitehall and various other guys playing with us. Not too many of them were were uh, worked at the worked at the tannery, really. Most of the Black Eagles that were so good were local people, except uh, Ted Essenberg. The rest of them were all local people. Well, Ted worked at the tannery uh, after that. Rex, Dexter, Harry Grassmeyer, Ted Essenberg, Paul Simonson, Raymond Funnel, uh, Paul Zatsky. Well, all a, local people. I was on that team. Huh? I was not on that team. I said Rex so. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's the time we had mostly local paid guys on that team. Yeah. Yeah. We're the ones that played the longest together. Oh, yeah. Are you, um, are there, who's, who's left from the Black Eagles team? <laughs> the two of you. We're the only ones that are left, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. I don't think Toddy Grow isn't around anymore. They're all gone. They're all gone. All of them. Yeah. I was looking at the picture I had home. I don't I remember to bring it, and I didn't. Well, I had just, um, I, I know, I had just a few questions about just the concerns in the community about the pollution. I mainly wanted to focus on the Black Eagles basketball team, but since you worked there, Dexter, and you you live there, just, just your opinion on... Um, what did you think when the community started having concerns about pollution and related to the town? Well, I can't give you much of that. Dexter would know more yeah. about that because he worked there for many more years than I did, and he worked in the office area where all these things would go through. And well, you know, the tannery was actually operated on the best basis of, of most tanneries in the country. We sold our flushings our hide trimmings and our hair. We put the fleshings in gondolas and covered them with lime and sold them to Peter Cooper Corporation. The fleshings were used for fertilizer. The trimmings were used for... Uh, uh, well, the fleshings would be the huh? t one of the high parts of the thing that they took off would be called the fleshings. Yeah, that's what one part. And, and the hair was sold for uh, pads under rugs and for felt hats. And when that was discontinued, then we started to burn the hair in our process. 
But uh, that was profit. We couldn't we couldn't throw that out. And of course, they accused us of throwing uh, hides in the lake. We we couldn't afford to throw hides in the lake. They were too hard to get. Yeah. But we did take trimmings that after the the skins were tanned, and we trimmed off uh, before the, uh, the before they went upstairs. We took those trimmings and and put them in bales and put them along the side of our settling pond to keep the waves from washing it out. But you, the, that stuff that was tanned. You could take your shoe and throw it into the lake. It wouldn't pollute the lake. Neither did those after they were tanned. Yeah. Well, I, they used it as a seawall, or more or less, from, from the lake to the swamp area along the side of the tannery. You might say that instead of cement or something, they used used this what Dexter's talking about that they took off in the leather that they couldn't use and bailed them and. Use them as like a seawall across there. Well, and I'm I'm not necessarily asking you, you know, about the pollution as much as just what people who worked at the tannery thought when concerns were raised. Did they was it upsetting? Well, they, or? they knew that what they were doing really wasn't a pollution going into the lake, but people thought because of, they were putting stuff out there that it was going to pollute the lake, but Actually, it wouldn't hurt the lake. I don't think anybody yeah. in the tannery was ever worried about pollution. No. But uh, I went down to the uh, school uh, to meet with the people from Sylvan Beach that were concerned about the tannery pollution. And I spent a couple, three hours down there. And the engineer that had built the uh, Hook up for the wastewater for the city of Whitehall was, I, was his home was right on uh, the shores of White Lake. Now I asked him where his uh, effluent went. It went right into the White Lake, <laughs> and of course he didn't say anything about that. But that's what happened to White Lake. Cottages that were around the lake were the summer cottages became full time places. Yeah, so they all, they there all had septic tanks and then they had a line that ran out underground into White Lake. So <laughs> were there were there any thoughts about some of the chemicals that were used, like the chromium or anything like that? Not the tannery, no. <laughs> well, I don't know whether whether there was no thought about it. You, you know, we tried to keep as little chrome going in the lake as possible. Tried to get it taken up by the hides as they were being tanned. But uh, you see, there was never any any. The only thing that I ever said the tanner did for the lake, we contributed to weed growth. Because when the hides came in full of fertilizer, and we washed it off, and it was in the water, there was no way for us to get it back out. So it went through the ponds, and eventually that did get into White Lake. So I did say we probably contributed to weed growth, but that's all. Yeah, no, nothing else. Lake, all the heavy part, the heavy stuff settled in these ponds and was pumped out once a year. Do you, um, I know, I think it was you, Rex, who mentioned that um, that the um, tannery was going fairly strong even during the Depression. Or was it you, Dexter? Was it going what? Was going fairly strong even oh, during yes. the Depression. I don't think the Depression was for hurt the tannery one bit, do you? No, I have an article that was written in the Muskegon Chronicle. There was over 300 people working at the tannery at that time. And 
Mr. Hatton kept the tannery running even though they weren't selling any of their product. That's when they piled these hides up in that fifth floor they, they, that they were they, there when I went to work there. Yeah, they didn't let anybody off or fire anybody. They kept the no. same no. working people there at the tannery. I don't ever remember them. Yep. Only when they had the strike that time was the only time it was shut down. All right. Well, they went, got a union in there at one time, and they uh, went on, we went on strike. I had just started just started working there, and they had the damn strike. <laughs> so. Uh, what did you do at the tannery, Rex? Well, I at one time I was working in various places. Primarily going to Roy Radcliffe, who was the superintendent, was going to be one of the guys eventually to handle one of the departments or or whatever. I I worked uh, worked all all over the various places in the tannery, probably five or six different uh, areas with the soup kitchen and the, and uh, uh, well. I, uh, I never did work on the uh, embossing machines down in the basement. I never worked on any embossing machines. But you worked there, uh, up there before... I the worked tackers, upstairs. For, before the tackers got the leather, yeah. you, you handled it. Yeah, and uh, I, did, I was working in various places because with that in mind, according to Roy Radcliffe, I was going to be given to one of the heads of someone on the plant, or parts of the plant, uh, eventually. How long did you work at the tannery about? Oh, God, I, I think when, uh, up until when the war came, I think I was still working at the tannery, wasn't I? Or was I working at Continental then? And the reason I left the tannery, I guess, was because the pay was at Continental was, was more at that particular time. But I, I, I'm just trying to think why, why I left the tannery. I don't, know. I don't remember if it was because I got a job over. Oh, I did, I did. I was playing baseball for a Continental in Muskegon, and they want the guy that Baker is his name. He uh, had wanted me to come in his office one time, and he said, "Why don't you come over here and work for us instead of working at the tannery?" We we pay, you know, X amount of dollars more than the tannery does. And he said, we'd give you a job here, uh, a good job, just for playing baseball for us. <laughs> so I said, well, I guess it can't beat that. You know, money talks. And so that's when I went to work at the, at the Continental in Muskegon. And, uh, and a couple of, Toddy Grow and a couple of other guys were working there at that time too, so we had a car full of guys that, that worked, we worked third shift, and there were four of us that paid uh, Toddy to drive, and we, we, we uh, but, but that was... But they had to drive back and forth to Muskegon, yeah. where here they could almost walk to the tannery. Yeah. Of course, there were four or five of us in the car, so it wasn't it wasn't that much that we gave Toddy for for driving every time between the four or five of us that rode with him. It wasn't that expensive. Probably driving from White Oak. My brother drove down the tannery, and he usually picked Bertha and I both up to get you know. That's when Bertha worked down there. And we'd, we'd ride with Raymond down to the tannery, but. Uh, well, I've got another question for you, Rex. Since you were a barber for quite a long time. Uh, yeah, I started barbering in the oh, late 40s, I think it was. 47, 48 or something like that. It was after the war and I, and I did something and my, my mother said, well, why don't you go to barber college and work with, with your dad? So I went down to Grand Rapids, down to Detroit for six months to bar Green Barber College and uh, took up barbering down there and came back. And, but she's the one that kind of encouraged me to be a barber. 
Well, the, the reason I'm asking is that that's where people sit in, in a barber chair, they talk a lot. Oh, yeah. And I, I just wondered, I just had one, one other question for you, just, just that, did people talk about a lot about pollution, like when the, when the concerns came up? No, we talked more sports than okay. anything <laughs> in the barbershop. It was more football or baseball or basketball or, or whatever. We didn't talk about what we were doing down at the tannery or, yeah. or hardly any place, uh, more sports than anything. So you didn't hear any secrets, huh? No. That's probably a bartender, right? In fact, we on our wall at the tent at the barber shop was full of pictures. That whole wall. Anybody that had a picture of fish they'd caught or deer they'd shot or anything, we had them all on the wall at the tent or at the barber shop. Remember those? That we had them across the whole whole wall where the chairs were of, of fish that were taken. In fact, they'd caught a sturgeon. That was six foot long, out of White Lake, <laughs> and they the guys that caught that fish had it on Pitkin's Corner one time, and when they caught it, had it in the trunk of the car, and they took pictures of it. Charlie Kasner did, and then, and we had pictures of that about this big pictures of that big sturgeon that was taken out of White Lake, and uh, I don't know what they did with it. They went, they they sold. I think they told it to the place and. Uh, in Muskegon there, uh, what's the, oh, they, they sold, they took it over there anyhow and he gave it to patients that were in a, some type of a hospital, it really wasn't a hospital either, but they used the, TB. the fish for that. The TB hospital? Something, uh, yeah, but they used that fish, gave the fish to them, but. Uh, well, I've got one more question for you unless you have some other things to offer, but the whole project is focused around White Lake. What, what do you think the value of the lake is for the community? I mean, how important is White Lake to the community? Well, the community itself, I, I really don't know White Hall, White, what lake, what White Hall Lake does to itself, other than, other than as a resort area, is that people uptown or, or whatever, like Dexter or even myself, uh, for fishing and so forth, yes, but White Lake is, uh, I don't know, <laughs> what, what would you say? We were all too busy to, to uh, use, the use White Lake, because yeah. when, the, when the resorters were here, that's when <laughs> yeah. we were the busiest. Yeah, they, they, use, they use the lake, and the, but that's what made, well, White Lake was for Resorted like our, this area and our area over there were all resorts, and at this time of the year, there's nobody there. Maybe two or three of them would finally maybe get a job someplace and live there year round, but most of them right now uh, are houses that nobody's in, you know. We used the lake when we were younger to go ice skating and. Uh, Gordon Moore and used to take us with a, a, a sail and you go down that lake 50 miles an hour with that sailing. Yeah. But that's when we were still kids in oh, high yeah. school. Too and young. As far as using the lake after that, I had no use for the lake. Well, your mother never wanted you kids to go to the lake. What? Your mother never wanted you kids to go to the lake too much. No, because she, you had that uncle that drowned in the lake. She she took us down to Idlewild to go swimming. Yeah, that's where you used to go down there once in a while. Yeah, but uh, and we, uh, and of course we used to walk by the tannery and go down where the eagles are to yeah. go swimming. Yeah, when we were younger. Yeah, but that was that was some of those areas were the only good areas to yeah. to fish to swim in because they had a better sandy beach or whatever. A lot of the areas weren't that good. Now down where I live, yeah, we go out about 20 or 30 feet and then it drops right off into 20, 30 feet of water. It makes pretty good, but you have to be a, we had a, always had a raft. a raft out there I made for the kids. We had six or eight barrels and we made a raft and always tied that out every year for the kids to play on. But, uh,
Well, I want to thank you too for agreeing to be interviewed and um, for telling telling your your memories and recollections of, of the Black Eagles and the Tannery and and um, yeah, we we had the Black Eagles. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes, we did. And the and the gals had good basketball teams. Right. As well, and they we had two two boys two men's teams. On the Eagles, and we would call them Black Eagles, and they would call the Blackhawks, I think, or something like that. Your wife was the star for the girls' team. Girls' team. She and yeah. one of the Brightwells, Noreen, no, no, what was it, Brightwell girl? She and Berth were forwards on the team. Right. One of the Brightwell girls. And our, then when Kathleen Walters played with them, you know, if you know Kathleen, or didn't know Kathleen, she died now. She was about six foot five or six. <laughs> she came to school to her Whitehall. Her folks came over from England. And uh, did he work at Henry? He did. Yeah, he did, yeah. But they came over here and she went to school at Whitehall and naturally when she was about six foot five or six, she was in our grade. She was a star on the basketball team. And, uh, but, uh, well, again, I want to thank you, too. Thank you, Dexter, and thank you, Rex. Well, I hope we got something out of it, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, White Lake has been real good to us, uh, even mm -hmm. when I bought the house down the lake. Uh, when we were kids, uh, they used to take us down there by the Idlewild, by the, where the Eagles, or the uh, Eagles are now, over this way more. That was good swimming area out in there. So it was a well, popular swimming area? Pardon? It was a popular swimming area? Well, for local people who didn't have cars and could drive too far, otherwise we went down to Lake Michigan at Duck Lake and swam at Duck Lake and Lake Michigan. But locally, you'd find a lot of people swimming down there. You don't see anybody anymore. But in those days, there used to be quite a few of them swim. Uh, the Idle Wild was down there, and the, the villa, White Lake Villa or something, to a couple resort areas. They were there and used the lake a lot. In 1929, my mother and my older sister drove to Grand Haven to see Mr. Uh, Hatton to see if he wouldn't donate rather to cover their annuals with. Yeah. And so the annuals are covered with some beautiful leather from Eight Lateral Leather Company. Oh, 1929 that. or something, wasn't it, with Doris? Yeah. Some of them? Yeah. We've got one, we got, got one. I think we got one of those annuals with a leather cover on it. Yeah. And they had to get him to, them to donate the, the yeah. leather for their, their covers for their annuals. Yeah. Yeah. And with Doris's. What, a Doris's year? Uh -huh. Yep, yeah, on Doris's year, yeah. 1929. Yeah. Well. Okay, well thank you again. Okay.